Welcome back to Those Happy Places, the podcast that treats theme parks, rides, and attractions like literature. I'm Buddy Duquesne. And I'm Alice White. And Alice, we are back for the third episode of the mini-series that is constantly expanding uh, <laughs> that we call Birds of Paradise. Birds of Paradise are ever-spiraling, ever-lengthening mini-series all about the Enchanted Tiki Room and uh, Walt Disney and his relationship with the Dole Pineapple Company. And uh, we are about to get, we are getting closer and closer to talking about the Dole Pineapple Company. Um, and this week, we're going to be talking about the history of Hawaii. Yeah, uh, the entire history of the uh, Hawaiian Islands, here now for you, presented uh, in its entirety. Uh, and it's most complete form possible in about uh, 10 to 15 minutes on a theme park podcast. Uh, so uh, in in advance, I would like to apologize for any details that we miss. Um, I would also like to apologize for our uh, limited resources here in talking about this. Um, we are but humble theme park podcasters who dabble in studying history once in a while. Uh, but, you know... The, the purpose of this is to provide context for this uh, theme park attraction opened 1963. Uh, so what we're trying to establish is a timeline of events that kind of explain uh, the, the context surrounding the opening of the Tiki Room uh, and the, uh, you know, statehood of Hawaii in 1959. Uh, and so kind of establishing what happened before those four years, 59 and 63, uh, that led to this very singular, unique theme park attraction. Right. And so we obviously won't be able to cover the complete and exhaustive history of the, uh, of the Hawaiian Islands, which are uh, it, it is endlessly fascinating topic, and we definitely recommend you reading up on it. Um, but we're going to cover uh, some some basic facts and some uh, major events and, and a basic timeline that leads us to the point where the Tiki Room is established. Um, so shall we get started? Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> a long time ago, uh, the Earth was ruled by dinosaurs. Uh, then something well, happened. A giant a little... meteorite struck the earth. <laughs> Goodbye, dinosaurs. Little, <laughs> Am I right? More, maybe a little more recent than that, but... Oh, uh, okay. Uh, um, <laughs> a long time ago, on some islands far, far away. Uh, <laughs> uh... <laughs> the, the, no, but really, the story of Hawaii begins around uh, 400 to 500 A.D., Right. In in about about that time period, uh Hawaii the Hawaiian Islands were discovered by Polynesian settlers and explorers, uh, who previously were uh had made their settlements in uh, other parts of the South Pacific, uh Fiji, Tahiti, uh New Zealand. Uh the Polynesian settlers really spread forth across the whole Pacific and discovered the Hawaii, which is a set of volcanic islands. Um, in the right smack dab in the middle of the Pacific Ocean um, and lived there uh, relatively uh, peacefully and uh, untouched by Western civilization uh, until the year 1778. Yeah, and uh, it's important to note that it was believed that the Hawaiian Islands were uninhabited when the Polynesian settlers arrived. So they, they kind of sailed into these islands uh, not entirely by chance. They were very skilled navigators uh, and, you know, were able to settle without encountering any other people. So this was truly right. fresh land for them to settle. Absolutely. And so there, there are several islands and there were several tribes and there were several groups and lots of chieftains. And uh, Hawaii was not a, an entire nation uh, at this point. Uh, in 1778 is when the European settler... Uh, slash explorer James Cook. He was uh, a British explorer slash settler um, who, uh, quote unquote, discovered Hawaii uh, in 1778. He referred to them as the Sandwich Islands, um, which he named after the Earl of Sandwich, who was one of his big uh, benefactors at the time. Um, and he 
uh, he explored and uh, communicated with the Hawaiian people and uh, generally made a nuisance of himself uh, until his uh, departure in 1779, uh, at which time he uh, used temple idols as firewood and uh, angered the chief and um, they killed him for it. <laughs> he did not survive. Uh, he died in Hawaii. That was uh, he. He was famous for uh, discovering and settling on uh, a big part of the Pacific. He he touched uh, Australia and New Zealand and Fiji and Tahiti and plenty of other places. But he died on the beach in Hawaii. Yes, after again uh, defacing and destroying a temple and trying to use the temple idols as firewood. Uh, yeah, a, a truly heinous act that uh, seems really needless and foolish. Uh, like if you're if you're like, okay, I'm here to explore and discover and try not to be the worst, that might be <laughs> something you don't do. Yeah, um, it's generally <laughs> frowned upon, I think. Um, but you know, his his reign of terror didn't end there um, because from then on, uh, Hawaii, uh, which of course had no resistance to the diseases that the British brought along with them, uh, Hawaii was ravaged by influenza, smallpox, measles, uh, famine, wars, all kinds of just all kinds of nonsense hit Hawaii. Um, and by the 1850s, um, a about a fifth of the Hawaiian people uh, had died of measles alone. Um, and so so James Cook could not just leave well enough alone, I suppose. He couldn't even just die, um, but <laughs> had to, uh, which which sounds harsh. But you know the effects of the Europeans uh, arriving on Hawaii uh, were long lasting. Uh, we're talking about a period of of eighty years where mm -hmm. this was thoroughly felt the consequences of this first. Uh, expedition i guess to the hawaiian islands um yeah. and you know the u.s presence for its part uh sort of became uh, sort of began with um american protestant missionaries and also with uh commerce trade merchants yes. uh so that was a huge part of how america and hawaii's relationship started so the the U.S. presence really started in the late 1700s with traders um, and really kicked off after Kamehameha II inherited the throne in 1819 when the Protest Protestant missionaries to Hawaii really um, got started and, and, and converted many Hawaiians to Christianity. Um, during the reign of King Kamehameha III, um, Hawaii was a Christian monarchy uh, with the signing of the 1840 Constitution. Um, yeah, and, very quick. Yeah, th that's a that's a rather fast. Like Hawaii unifies under Kamehameha the uh, first, and then two kings later uh, is a Christian monarchy, and that's only a period of about what forty years, uh, which is again very very quick. Uh, and something that stood out to me is that the part of the whole convert to Christianity thing meant the end of many traditional Hawaiian uh, traditional practices. Right. Uh, so a lot of the culture of Hawaii, even back in the 1820s, uh, was already in the process of being lost or destroyed. Right. Uh, lost, destroyed, changed, um, and kind of even hidden away. Um, as the uh, American uh, missionaries start to kind of take over the uh, take over the islands um, in 1875, um, Hawaii and the U.S. signed what was called the Reciprocity Treaty, um, which gave access to the United States for to which gave the United States access to the sugar market and other products grown in Hawaii. Um, in return, the U.S. gained lands in uh, in Pearl Harbor. And so that's when when Pearl Harbor was established, a part of the, the Treaty of 1875. Um, and so because now the U.S. had a, a naval base in Pearl Harbor and open trade between the two nations, um, a lot of in a, a lot of American investors started um, 
having stake in Hawaiian lands, sugarcane plantations, coffee plantations, and and many other um, many other goods. Right, and this all led to a uh, another treaty being signed, or rather, another constitution being signed by King David Kalakaua. Uh, and this was definitely a uh, a constitution signed under duress. Uh, uh, this is literally to, at gunpoint. <laughs> right. This is this is referred to as the bayonet constitution because uh, King David at the time did not have a choice. Um, this stripped the monarchy of its power. Uh, it definitely established uh, voting rights, but only for wealthy white people. Um, yes. And also uh, reduced basically all Hawaiian royalty to the role of figureheads. Uh, at this point, the Hawaiian monarchy was more or less destroyed uh, and white wealthy business people more or less owned the islands. Right. It is important to note here that the Bayonet Constitution was co-written by a man named Sanford Dole, who we will get to in just a moment. And that name uh, is not a coincidence. And it's not a coincidence. So Sanford Dole, amongst others, um, wrote the Constitution that they forced uh, King David to sign. And uh, he, he served as a figurehead monarch until his death in 1891, when his sister... Queen Liliuokalani uh, succeeded him, and she was the last monarch of Hawaii. She's a she's a very very famous, very uh, iconic figure in Hawaiian history. If you've not heard of any of this before, you may have heard of Queen Liliuokalani. Right, uh, she's actually famous for a, a second reason. Uh, she wrote the Hawaiian song Aloha Oi, which uh, is a beautiful tune. And, and it's definitely a song that is uh, mournful uh, about the fate of the Hawaiian islands uh, and ho the Hawaiian royalty and the Hawaiian culture um, it, during this period. Yes. She became queen uh, after her brother died in 1891. And, uh, but almost immediately, the uh, overthrowing of Queen Liliuokalani began uh, in January 1893. Uh, so she was she was queen for only maybe two years. Um, the revolutionaries who who uh, uh, wanted to overthrow her, um, their ultimate goal was the annexation of the islands to the United States. They were mostly American businessmen, uh, including Sanford Dole, who was a citizen of Hawaii, um, and he. Um, was very successful after they overthrew uh, the queen. He was, uh, Sanford Dole was uh, president of the Republic of Hawaii. He became president in 1893. And Queen Lilio Kalani was put under house arrest. Uh, she was put under house arrest under uh, an attempted, or after an attempted uh, kind of Return a recoup. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, she was, uh, there, were, there were supporters of her and of the monarchy that tried to reinstate her and after that attempt was quelled um she was placed under house arrest uh permanently yes uh, so it's it's really interesting that uh a whole revolution got thrown with the sole purpose of hawaiian annexation Yes, and like it the was the stated goal was we want to be a goal. republic of hawaii so mm -hmm. that the us can annex us Yes, that was the, the state of goal. They said, we really want to be part of the United States or we want to be annexed by the United States. And it's all, it's important to note, too, that the that the, the people that were behind this revolution um, were they were called the Committee of Safety. And they were uh, 13 white, mostly American business owners who were uh, mad because uh, Queen Lilio Kalani tried to reimpose tariffs on their exports so that um, they could, you know, Hawaii maybe could be making some money off of the exports that they were sending to America. And they, of course, didn't like that um, because they wanted a uh, free and open trade between the two, between the two nations. They didn't want to have to pay extra money to ship things to America. Um, 
And so that, I mean, the Committee of Safety, which is That's, just... Uh, what a name. Ab- um, <laughs> just ridiculous and um and that was the whole thing that they they deposed an entire monarchy simply because they really wanted to be able to ship things like coffee and sugar to america without having to pay a little extra money this is about making slightly less money right and they these men did not enjoy that they didn't they like did making like slightly less money <laughs> They didn't. And so by the time they overthrew the queen and uh, Sanford Dole became president in 1893, um, uh, the U.S. businessmen who were established in, in Hawaii really started to flourish and they became a very popular place for businesses to kick off. Um, it is it's. I don't know. It's important to note here that um, the president of the United States at the time, uh, Grover Cleveland, thought that um, that, quote, substantial wrong has thus been done, which a due regard for our national character, as well as the rights of the injured people requires we should endeavor to repair the monarchy. Uh, Grover Cleveland did not like that uh, U.S. business people had done this. No, um, uh, and and he actually presented Sanford Dole with a demand to reinstate the Queen, uh, uh, which, which he just said no to. He just <laughs> said no to. It he was basically said, you can't, a, you, can't tell, you can't tell me what to do, Annex President me, of the United then, States, and then you can tell me what to do. <laughs> and uh, so when Grover Cleveland was not um, uh, reelected to the presidency. Um, uh, William McKinley was the was the president that followed. Uh, William McKinley really liked the idea of annexation, um, so Hawaii was annexed. Yeah, and it's also important to note that the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, immediately after this first investigation started by Grover Cleveland, uh, had another investigation started by pro annexation uh, kind of you know partisans. Uh, that then went uh, out of its way to debunk the first investigation. Be like, oh, no, all those reports of of wrongdoing and harm done to the Hawaiian people. Here are some uh, testimonies from uh, God-fearing American citizens uh, that were just afraid of their, for their safety. Uh, And that's awful. Yep. Oh, my God. And that is why uh, nothing was done about that. Um, until fully 100 years later when uh, President Bill Clinton signed a resolution offering an apology to the Native Hawaiians on the behalf of the United States, which obviously an apology does not um, solve everything. Um, no, by and no it means. was fully 100 years later, but it's definitely a start. That does not happen often. The U.S. does not often apologize for things. So there you go. <laughs> That's something. That's uh, but something. From from 1993, I'd like to go back a little bit to 1901. Uh, yes. To to uh, re re bring up uh, a, a familiar name. Uh, yes. Not not Sanford Dole this time though. No, no, we're going to talk about James Dole, his cousin. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine, if you will, that your cousin becomes president of uh, an island nation, uh, and you decide to capitalize on that by uh, trying your hand at growing coffee. Yes, <laughs> so you decide to try to grow coffee in Hawaii and somehow fail at that, even though coffee was already a uh, a crop that could be grown in Hawaii and well in Hawaii. Yeah, and, and now Hawaiian Kona coffee specifically is uh, among the most favored coffee in the world. But but it's... James Dole, uh, <laughs> famed a capitalist, could not make coffee grow on Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> no, he his his coffee business failed, um, and so he decided instead to start the Hawaiian Pineapple Company. That's what he called it. The Hawaiian Pineapple Company was founded in 1901, which is while Sanford Dole, his cousin, uh, was still president. He had been president from 1894 and continued to be president until 1903. When he became Uh, first governor of the territory of Hawaii. Yes, yes. Um, The Dole family was in power for quite some time. (laughs) Yes, for quite a long time. Longer than some monarchs. 
Yeah, uh, but I'm sure, I'm sure that he had nothing to do with his cousin's uh, success in business. No. 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 That's sarcasm. <laughs> of course he had something to do with his cousin's success in business. The Dole name was very, uh, was worth a lot in Hawaii. And so uh, James Dole's pineapple company, the Hawaiian Pineapple Company, uh, kicked off. So his uh, his company really kicked off when he developed a canning process for pineapples so that they would keep on the long journey back to the United States. Um, they tried to ship fresh pineapples. They would inevitably go bad very quickly. So he started canning them and he really, it really kicked off. I mean, people loved those pineapples uh, and he went from producing only 243,000 cases of canned pineapple in 1909 to 1,775,000 cases in 1920. Um, it was a, a great success. Just a massive rate of growth. Um, and the thing, the thing about Hawaii and pineapples and their relationship is that the Dole Company almost completely single-handedly, at this point not called the Dole Company, called the Hawaiian Pineapple Company, almost single-handedly fabricated that relationship. The pineapple is not a native plant of Hawaii. No, it's a native plant to South America, uh, specifically to Paraguay and southern Brazil. Um, and so some, somebody, um, I don't think it was James Stoll, um, but somebody decided to bring uh, pineapples to Hawaii and James Dole decided that was a wonderful idea. And so he started the Hawaiian Pineapple Company. Right. Um, so he, so, but the, the company and the lore around the pineapples that come from Hawaii decided to tell everyone in all of their advertising that uh, the pineapple was Hawaiian's favorite fruit it was an ancient tradition in hawaii they really started pushing all of this propaganda that said hawaii um and pineapple were basically one and the same right and and not to go too far out on a limb here but when the enchanted tiki room would open with the dole pineapple company's name on it uh and had that original film uh it, it would claim that Hawaiian pineapples were the fruit of kings uh, and royalty and had been had been long enjoyed by the people of Hawaii. And, and that's just it's simply not true. It's simply not true, first and foremost, because by the time he started his company, there were no more kings in Hawaii. Right. They had overthrown the last queen, even um, there's and there were pi pineapples were not a thing on Hawaii really before that. There, so, there were some pineapples brought during the reign of some Hawaiian royalty, but it was not a major crop. No, I think it was uh, Kamehameha II, I think, was the was a monarch at the time that the very first pineapple was brought, um, which still was like still less than 100 years and not enough time for it to have become a, a major Hawaiian export. An ancient tradition. <laughs> An ancient tradition. By no, no means. Uh, and so, you know, this this got this got to the point where Dole was uh, issuing uh, all sorts of advertising that said things like "insist on Hawaiian pineapples." Um, and by 1922, the Dole Company, uh, then called the Hawaiian Pineapple Company, was supplying three fourths of all the world's pineapple. Of the world's pineapple. This is nearly a, a monopoly uh, predicated on, a, you know, first and foremost, a lie. <laughs> and the second and second most, the overthrow of an entire island nation's uh, government. Yes. Um, but the thing was, is that it, I mean, it obviously worked. The lies, the linking the fruit to Hawaii and, you know, oh, it's a tropical paradise where these fruits come from. Like housewives who were doing all of the cooking and all of the preparing for the house um, apparently really did insist on pineapples from Hawaii because they were perceived to be sweeter and better than other kinds of pineapple. And that's part of what spurred on the, uh, the monopoly is why um is why they were able to be so successful that lie worked shockingly well yeah and so eventually 
uh, James Dole would pass away. Uh, and I will pause a moment here for dramatic effect so that the audience can guess what year that was. 1958. 1958. The year before Hawaiian statehood. Uh, and that year, uh, the company formerly known as the Hawaiian Pineapple Company would become the Dole Pineapple Company. So, uh, Alice, what, what exactly was the process of annexing and eventually granting statehood to Hawaii? Right. So, like we said, William McKinley was president at the time when he won the 1896 U.S. presidential election. Um, and immediately, right away, people were, were saying, we have to annex Hawaii. We have to annex Hawaii. Um, and so, within a year, he signed the Newlands Resolution. Um, and... Uh, which provided for the annexation of Hawaii uh, in 1898. Um, part of the reason behind that was one of the reasons why he was convinced to do that. One, he wasn't that opposed. It seemed like a pretty good idea. Um, but uh, at the time, they, uh, the Spanish-American War was raging, and Congress thought that having a Pacific naval base in Pearl Harbor would be um, strategically beneficial um, so when William McKinley signed the Newlands Resolution and officially annexed Hawaii, but it wasn't until 1959 that Hawaii became an official state of the Union. And so um, Hawaii spent about uh, 60 years as a uh, as a territory. Uh, right. and, and that includes, you know, very famously the entire period during World War II when Pearl Harbor would be both one of the starting points of America's involvement in and an important strategic base during uh, that entire conflict. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, was he wrong that it was a good idea to have a base there? Not exactly. But was it worth the destruction? <laughs> Uh, I, no, well, no, I mean, I, no, uh, I mean, no. We no. are we though are are famous pacifists, and uh, <laughs> could we have maybe just asked really nicely to establish a uh, a base there, or just had the base there and not totally overthrown the monarchy and uh and then annexed the entire nation? Uh, yeah, I would. I mean, I would. I would like to hope so. <laughs> well, it's but hard to, we'll it's never hard know. To <laughs> establish a point in this timeline where it seems like the destruction of the Hawaiian people and their culture was not almost predetermined from the start. I mean, yeah. as soon as James Cook lands and brings the diseases and then starts with the defacing of temples, which, you know, seems oddly connected to what would happen with the American missionaries. Um, it, it seems like this is... This is a story that has been repeated around the world uh, any time that native populations and European or American settlers met. Um, mm -hmm. First, an exchanging of, uh, you know, cultures very, very briefly. Uh, some brief conflict. Disease follows. Uh, then the slow erosion of culture until eventually that place is just America now, or just <laughs> or another England part of now, England or... now. Um, and Alice, to, to kind of tie it all back um, to the Enchanted Tiki Room, it opened 1963 in Anaheim, California, in Disneyland. Um... You know, back then, Disneyland had a Native American sort of exposition area in Frontierland. Uh, and it's exactly as racist caricature as you imagine. Oh, good. Uh, it was a bunch of teepees. Uh, there was dancing. Um, there were archery exhibits, exhibitions, things like that. Um, and it was very, um, like, white gazy. Uh, like you're, you're meant to kind of walk around and observe these almost displays where Native American actors, uh, to, for lack of a better term, would kind of show off parts of their culture. And you're supposed to be kind of enthralled and interested and intrigued by all of that. But it's all kind of like roped off. It's not really interactive. It's more of a 
diorama with living uh -huh. people inside of it. Oh boy. <laughs> right, and and when we when I describe that to you, that's um absolutely unacceptable by today's standards, right? Definitely. Uh, something that we would we cringe at in retrospect. And I guess my question is what makes Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room any different from an historic standpoint? This is uh, the same story of, of people uh, losing their culture and their homes and mm -hmm. their rights um, over a period of, of many years. Uh, then having their culture uh, commoditized and put on display. Um, and and celebrated for how quaint and wonderful it is to enjoy this unique culture. I... What makes the Enchanted Tiki Room... I mean, I don't cringe when I'm in the Enchanted Tiki Room. No. Much. <laughs> Much. Maybe maybe at the beginning. But yeah, once the birds front, start for singing. Sure. Yeah. Um, I have two theories as to why the Tiki Room has been, uh, has endured for much longer than that, uh, that other part that we were just talking about and for why it doesn't, um, it doesn't feel like on, on a surface level, I mean, obviously we're deep diving into it, but why on a surface level, it doesn't feel as, um, exploitative maybe as, as the other thing. Um, theory number one is that, um, is that it's birds <laughs> is that it's birds instead of people you know what like, I, at... i've been thinking about it and there are a lot of birds there are a lot of birds and they sing words oh, and, and the flowers croon and the flowers croon in the tiki room and i i think maybe it's the animatronic nature of the birds the kind of cartoony-ness of talking singing birds and flowers um it's kind of like uh, baby's first introduction to Hawaii, <laughs> um, and and but it literally this almost feels like a pun. It literally like <laughs> like dehumanizes the idea. It takes the human part of how we know where Hawaii is and what the Hawaiian culture is because of conquest and, and annexation and takeover and all that. Um, we <laughs> and it takes that human part of it out of the picture altogether and it says hey but look at the birds <laughs> look at the birds look at the flowers let's sing a pretty song eat your pineapple sing along with us it, it's literally removed like people removed from the from the equation altogether um you know colonialism is at its heart dehumanizing yes and that we've landed on the word dehumanizing because the human element is literally taken out. Yes. So it's dehumaned. Yes. Which, which I think is is maybe a more accurate way to say it, though that is I'm, a made up word. I mean, <laughs> right? But no, but you're right because I use the word dehumanizing. But you're you're right. What I really literally mean is it has been dehumaned. The the, <laughs> the human has been removed from the situation entirely, um, and 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 not just human but like literally like life it's all animatronics it's all fake um so it's easy to kind of just look at it and go wow how cute and fun how interesting this animatronic is and at the time how groundbreaking you know it's easy to to step back from it right which um which also brings me to my second theory um which is that hawaii is just far away <laughs> the, the the other idea of why we are more able to stomach something like the tiki room than something like a living diorama of insert n generic native american tribe here um is because na like native america that's here california has like a, a a long and rich history with um with you know, native tribes here. Like uh, anybody who lives in Southern California is 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 familiar with, you know, settlements that have been here and missions and and all of that. We 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 understand that here. Um, yeah. To then go two thousand miles away into the ocean, which especially at the time that that the Tiki Room went in, almost nobody had ever been to. Um, 
it's far away. That's somebody else's problem. That's somebody else's thing. That's somebody else's annexation. Um, because it's literally 2,000 miles away from, from California. And so if you remove the human element from it altogether and then push it 2,000 miles <laughs> from where we're sitting, um, it's easy to just kind of go, ah, it's the Tiki Room. It's not like that thing over there that used to be with the diorama and the exploitation. This is just the Tiki Room. You know, I, I, I think that's a pretty good theory. Uh, and I'd like to add like one little chunk to it. Uh, and it, it's this Hawaiian statehood in 1959 and the opening of the Enchanted Tiki Room in 1963 is like an endlessly fascinating time frame to me. Mm -hmm. uh, like those four years are just so loaded, right? Like it's just four years since these islands became a state. And it those four years were the time that it took to develop a, an incredible feat of technology for sure uh and a revolutionary attraction in in theme park history um it's also zero time it's it's, it's so like fast. none and the space between annexation in 1898 and statehood in 1959 again just 60 years uh, and it, that's on the grand scheme, on the grand scale, I mean, even even in American history, uh, it feels pretty short. It feels like not much time. And even then, uh, you know, the the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy. That was only in 1893. Yeah. I mean, that's between between the overthrow of the monarchy and annexation was was only a couple of years. And we're talking about just just these little tiny time frames. And I feel like part of why it doesn't feel as icky, um, uh, part of why it doesn't feel as colonialist is because it feels like recent history. And for audiences in 63, especially, it kind of feels like a, a win, like a victory. Yeah, um, you're right the the narrative being uh we overthrow those those heathenists i mean they were christians at the time so maybe heathenists isn't the right no, word no i think i think it's more about we overthrow the uh, overthrow a monarchy right yeah. america we overthrew that monarchy is, america is nothing but like anti monarchist right <laughs> like yeah. um like America's all about overthrowing monarchies. That's and what so we when they do. Say, That's what this nation was founded on. <laughs> so if you think there was this nation not too far away, but far enough away to be quote unquote exotic, and we overthrew a monarchy and established democracy there, you know. And then I, I, and then the, I want you to hear very like sarcastic. Um, right. It italics on those right. words <laughs> and then they liked america so much they practically begged to be annexed and turned into a territory and then right a away. state yay and, a state. and now they're a state and now isn't we have that, 50 of them isn't That's that the a, american it, dream it's such is a, a nice, nice round number round of states. number <laughs> of states 50 entire states of hawaii was number 50 and look at that we just tied it up with a little bow. Now we have 50 whole states. America is finally done. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> uh, Alice, I, it's exhausting. Um, it's exhausting. To even put yourself in that mind frame. Because it's not its not correct. Like, there's no part of it that's correct. Um, it, it's like the relationship to the pineapple. It's propaganda. Mm -hmm. um, and it's i mean it's hard to wrap your head around keeping the truth of what happened and this this kind of pervasive narrative of how hawaii became that nifty 50 state um <laughs> and also then there's the question of the popularity of tiki culture and the popularity of uh, Hawaiian aesthetics uh, mm -hmm. in this era specifically and how the Tiki Room fits into all of that but I believe 
that is within the scope of our next episode. Yes, yes, our next episode, Tiki Culture, Tiki Bars, Walt Disney's fascination with Tiki aesthetics in general. That is what our topic for the next episode is. That That is what our topic for the next episode will be. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, it sounds a, a bit to me like our conversation about uh, the history of the Hawaiian Islands, their uh, rediscovery by Europeans, uh, the long history of the erosion of the Hawaiian monarchy, the overthrow of that same monarchy, the annexation of the islands, and Hawaiian statehood has come to an end. Wow, wow, we, talk, we talked about a lot, and we have even more to talk about, and we will do that on the internet. Yes, on the internet. You know, the conversation always continues online, and we by no means uh, claim to be the be-all, end-all experts on this topic. So if you'd like to add something or you'd like us to discuss another point that you think we've missed, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter. Yes, you can find the show on Twitter at Happy Places Pod, and we are also individually on Twitter. I am at Alice White THP for those happy places. And I'm at Buddy underscore Duquesne. Duquesne is spelled D U Q U E S N E. Follow us on Twitter, and we will send you a link to join our amazing Discord server where all of our long conversations, more than 280 characters, uh, take place. We have an amazing group of people. That Discord server just passed 50 users. Wow. In that, yes which is such an awesome number for us to have hit. We're just absolutely thrilled that there are even that many people who like this podcast and listen to it and want to talk to us about it some more. And if you want to be one of those people, uh, you can hit us up on Twitter for that link or drop us an email at thosehappyplaces at gmail.com. That's correct. Uh, you know, <laughs> Alice, I think in this episode... We have forgotten to thank a couple of really important Patreon backers. Oh my gosh, you're right. Our Patreon backers, Charles Gustine and Asim Chaudhry, um, who are subscribers to our Patreon at the D-Ticket level and get their name shouted out in every episode. And they deserve it because they're excellent. Yes, thank you to those excellent gentlemen and scholars uh, the show is happening on a completely different level but because of you and because of everybody who supports us on Patreon. Uh, we really appreciate it, you guys. Uh, it's part of why we love doing what we do. Uh, you know, times are pretty tough right now. Uh, we try not to talk about it too much. Um, that you're out there still continuing to uh, support us during this time is amazing. Uh, but if for any reason you need to scale back your support, uh, we, we completely understand. We totally understand. But if you find yourself uh, in a position to help us out, um, you can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash those happy places. You can check out all of our bonus episodes, a couple of blog posts, um, some fun all over that page. And it really helps us get the show um, off the ground and into your ears. And um, it's Alice, just... you make it sound like we're picking the show up off the ground and putting, <laughs> and putting it in it people's into ears. Their ears. You know what? What if I am? Um, <laughs> what if that's what I do? It's not what I signed up to do. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, you, all, you all know what I mean. Um, they know. They do. Um, they do and they understand and if you know it this is if you find yourself in a position um to do that there's a lot of great uh backer rewards um and yeah check it out patreon.com slash those happy places yeah and uh alice uh i'm gonna put some music into this episode oh i love music what kind of music are you gonna put in this episode and where from so, Alice, all of the tracks that I'm using in this episode are from an album that I found on the Free Music Archive. The album is called Two Zombies Later. It's a collection of weird tiki music, um, <laughs> and it truly does have some weird tracks on it. I picked kind of the, the most instrumental laid back ones. Uh, so you can go and check that out on the Free Music Archive. Uh, and we use this music under a Creative Commons 4.0 attribution license. So what that means is I say thank you. It's the Free Music Archive, and then I direct you to the show notes where you can find each of the tracks' names and the artist behind them. 
uh, so that you can go and check out their work. Absolutely. And uh, thank you, Free Music Archive. And uh, and Buddy, thank you for editing this episode and putting all the music in and for being such an excellent co-host. Alice, you are a gentle lady and a scholar. Uh, uh-huh. Your research on this episode was fantastic and really did guide us through, uh, I think, a manageable amount of Hawaiian history. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, we, you should. You guys should see our notes, man. There are <laughs> lots of pages. <laughs> I uh, we, made uh, seven whole pages of notes for this episode. So yeah, um, I hope it was a uh, com- comprehensive and comprehensible. Yeah, uh, we we do love uh, doing those happy places and uh, birds of paradise. And I would not dream of doing this show without you. So thank you, Alice, for being thank an excellent you, buddy. co-host. And to everyone out there. We hope you return to our tropical hideaway.